While the Gamecocks lost 44-30 to to the Arkansas Razorbacks this past Saturday, unfortunately, it was not the only loss that we suffered this past weekend. Our Locked On Gamecocks, your daily podcast on the South Carolina Gamecocks. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, Gamecock Nation, and welcome back to the Locked On Gamecocks podcast, your show for daily headlines and potential storylines on your favorite South Carolina Gamecock sports teams. I'm your host, Andrew Lyon, and as always, thank you once again for making us your first listen every day. We are free and available on YouTube and wherever you get your podcast daily. And unfortunately, on today's show, we're going to have some real bad news that we are going to have to talk about regarding the health status of a couple of key defensive starters on South Carolina's football team in Jordan Strawn and Muhammad Kaba. I'll be addressing that at the beginning of the show. In the middle portion of the show, I'll be discussing a big official visitor that the Gamecocks are going to have on campus this coming weekend for their big-time matchup against the Georgia Bulldogs. And subsequently, at the end of the show, I'm going to discuss how the Gamecocks have fared in matchups against top five teams at home in recent memory, why maybe some of these losses in that stretch were so lopsided, and talk about whether or not this current coaching Seth we have could put this team in a better position to win or at least be really competitive in football games like the one coming up against Georgia once again. So that's going to be the roadmap for today's show. Let's go ahead and start off with the most somber news that I have to go over, and that is the fact that it has been officially announced that edge defender Jordan Strawn and middle linebacker Mohamed Kaba are going to be out for the rest of the 2022 season with torn ACLs for the both of them. So obviously, These are injuries that are just really, really serious for both of these guys. These guys are going to now have to rehab for at least six and maybe all the way up to 10 or 11 months to come back from both these injuries. Normally, it's somewhere between six to nine months. If you have a really good recovery process or subsequently a long and arduous recovery process, then it can be a little bit shorter or a little bit longer. But six to nine months is the typical range. Either way, just really sucks for both of these guys. A couple of football players who have put in a ton of work for this team during the offseason had really put themselves in position to be big-time contributors at a starting role for this defense. Overall, these are probably some of the worst injuries that this defense could have suffered. And if you want me to be technical, I think that it's the second and third worst injury that this defense could have suffered. So let's start off with Jordan Stratton again. Feel really bad for Jordan. Jordan, of course, had come back for a sixth season for South Carolina. He was going to be a super senior this year. He felt like they needed to come back in order to prove himself a little bit more at the SEC level. As, of course, in 2021, he was more of a rotational piece at that edge spot behind eventual fifth-round draft pick Kingsley Inakbari, who, of course, now plays for the Green Bay Packers. And Jordan Stratton had the pass rushing juice. But this past year, I think it was the physicality in the running game that Jordan Stratton really had a big learning curve with. And he found out really quickly that, yeah, it's a little bit different facing some of the offensive tackles in the SEC compared to some of the guys he was playing against in the Sun Belt. Again, no offense to the Sun Belt. As last weekend showed, the Sun Belt is a pretty tagum good group of five conference and honestly, probably the best in college football right now, surpassing even the American Athletic Conference. The point being, Jordan Strawn had gotten his feet wet as an SEC player in 2021. This was supposed to be a year where he was supposed to take an even bigger jump in his production, really get back to close to some of the sack numbers that he saw at Georgia State, now knowing how to attack some of these SEC offensive tackles a little bit better, being able to refine some of his skills under new edge defender, outside linebacker coach Sterling Lucas, and Again, things were looking up for him, and he had had a good start to the season against Georgia State and Arkansas. But now, 
he is out for the rest of the year. So what kind of impact does this loss have subsequently for the edge position and for the defensive line as a whole? Well, as I just mentioned, Jordan Strun is a pass rush specialist. That is obviously where his strengths lie. And in that department, we are definitely going to see a hit, in my opinion, on this defensive line. Zach Pickens and Alex Huntley both do a pretty good job in pass rush as interior defensive linemen. And Jordan Birch can have his solid moments as well. But in terms of... Of a finesse move arsenal, I think that Jordan Strine was probably the best out of the entire starting group. That's not, again, to say that any of the other guys don't have any moves in their arsenal, besides maybe just a typical bull rush or dip and rip, which is the most common moves that you will pretty much see out of college D linemen. But Jordan Strine's arsenal, in my opinion, was a little bit more diverse from a skill set standpoint. So who's going to be taking over? Well, the Gamecocks released a depth chart for this upcoming matchup against Georgia, and Gilbert Edmond has been listed as the starter taking over that role for Jordan Strine for the foreseeable future. Terrell Dawkins was listed as the backup at that spot, and I believe that Tyree Johnson is listed as the backup at the other defensive end spot behind Jordan Birch. So Gilbert Edmond, from a technique standpoint, I do think he is the best out of all the backups. So from that perspective, we might not see too much of a drop off. But the thing is, comparing Jordan Strawn to Gilbert Edmond, I think that Strawn offered a lot more length. And I think that he's someone that he's really good at knowing how to use his leverage and is a little bit more of an athlete than Gilbert Edmund. That's not to say Edmund is not athletic in any sense, but Edmund is a guy that really has to rely on his technique to win a lot of these one-on-one -on -one pass rushing battles. And I just don't see how Gilbert is going to do better in that regard compared to Jordan Strahan. I just think that we're going to see a little bit of a drop off in that aspect. So, Moving on from the Jordan Strawn loss to the loss of Muhammad Kaba. Kaba obviously had drawn rave reviews coming out of fall camp and throughout the offseason and was constantly mentioned as one of the players that had really just wowed the coaching staff and, quite frankly, the reporters who were at some of the open practices in fall camp. So... What happens here? Well, the depth at linebacker, in my opinion, is a little bit better than the depth, say, at the edge defensive end position. However, the guy that is taking over for him is Sherrod Green. Now, you might be wondering, well, Andrew, why do you say that like it's a negative? Well, there's one big reason why. We don't know if we can trust Sherrod Green to be durable at this point. We just have to face the facts. Sherrod Green has had his season ended prematurely both of the last two seasons due to a season-ending injury. In 2020, it was, I believe, a fracture in his hip. Last season, it was a horrific ankle, I believe, dislocation slash fracture in Week 3, ironically enough, against Georgia. Hope to gosh that's not going to happen once again. But Sherrod Green has apparently been banged up throughout a decent portion of fall camp. And he did not play a whole lot in week one against Georgia State, but he had to in week two against Arkansas, of course, because of the loss of Muhammad Kaba. And I got to say, I don't know if it was the play style of Arkansas or if it was the fact that he has not gotten a whole lot of reps recently in practice or in games, but Sherrod Green was one of the defenders that I noticed out of the entire starting 11 at that point who was getting absolutely gassed from some of these long, sustained drives. Now, of course, you put a guy like me in Sherrod Green's shoes, who's been injured, and in my case, is not very athletic, also in my case, is not in shape at all like Sherrod Green is, I would be gassed too. But it did kind of worry me a little bit just how much Sherrod Green was really having to take a few seconds after a lot of plays in order to really kind of catch his breath before he could get himself off the ground and get back to the huddle and line up for the next play. So... You know, there could be a concern of fatigue with Sherrod Green. If George is able to go into this matchup on Saturday and have some of these long sustained drives, is Sherrod Green going to be able to handle that? And of course, now with Green being the starting linebacker, we now have a true freshman, Stone Blanton, who is the second string Mike linebacker. Now, of course, Stone Blanton's got a ton of potential. He's a great athlete, a dual sport athlete who also plays baseball and was a consensus high three-star, low four-star recruit coming out of Mississippi this past recruiting cycle. So clearly, Stone Blanton's got a ton of potential. 
But like a lot of other positions on a football team, you don't want to necessarily have to rely on a true freshman more often than not having to be the starter at a position like the Mike linebacker spot. So the Gamecocks now have gone from being in a decent spot at Mike linebacker to now uh, things are a little bit more edgy. Things are going to be a little bit more concerning for the Gamecock fan base going forward. So that is the latest on both of these injuries. Again, Mohamed Kaba and Jordan Strawn both out for the season with torn ACLs. So that's the somber news for today's show. And I promise that's the only bad news we're really going to talk about besides maybe opening up some old wounds in segment three. But we have some great news on the recruiting front as we're going to have a big time five-star prospect for the 2023 cycle officially visiting the Gamecocks this coming weekend for their matchup against Georgia. Who is that prospect and what do the Gamecocks need to do to impress him and really set a high bar for the other schools who are going to get an official visit from this prospect? Well, we're going to get into all of that in just a few moments, but before I do that, I got to admit, y'all, when I've been looking at the gas pump recently, I, I've just been standing there and I've been cringing. I literally just start shaking because I can't even imagine the gas price that's getting ready to pop out once I filled up my gas tank to my truck. I can't stand the idea of going to one of my favorite restaurants and imagining what the check's going to be like once I'm done with my meal because inflation is hitting us everywhere right now. It hurts really badly for a lot of people, which is why I started using Upside. Upside's an incredible app for anyone who buys gas, groceries, or likes to dine out. And with every purchase, I'm earning cash back thanks to the Upside app, which has helped to alleviate my wallet whenever I go to make my weekly run at the grocery store, or whenever I've gone to get gas after going to the gym, or buying some things online that I need in order to maybe fill up my medicine cabinet or, you know, make this setup behind me a little bit better for those of you who are watching this show on YouTube. This isn't too good to be true is what I'm trying to get at. It is free. It's easy to use. Take it from me. I've used it and it works great. So to get started, download the free Upside app. Then use the promo code LOCKED to get $5 or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more. Next, claim an offer for whatever you're buying on Upside. Check in at the business, pay as usual with a credit card or debit card, and get paid instantly. Upside users are earning more than a million dollars back every single week. And if you still question how good Upside is, then I'll let the 4.8 star rating on the App Store speak for itself. So download the free Upside app and use the promo code LOCKED to get $5 or more cash back, again, on your first purchase of $10 or more. One more time. That's $5 or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more using the promo code LOCKED. Welcome back for segment two of this Tuesday edition of the Locked On Gamecocks podcast where we cover your South Carolina Gamecocks every single day. All right, so let's move on from the latest news on the injury front for the football team and talk about some positive news on the recruiting front as the South Carolina Gamecocks are hosting five-star athlete Nicholas Harbor this weekend for an official visit for the matchup against the Georgia Bulldogs. And Grayson Howard and Dante Reno, two four-star commits for both the 2023 and 2024 recruiting cycle, they've already started the chatter on Twitter about this big visit from Nicholas Harbor, dubbing it Nicholas Harbor Week, as both of these guys have really spearheaded the recruitment, honestly, for Nicholas Harbor, at least from the current commitment list that the Gamecocks have for the next two cycles and are warning Nicholas Harper to come to South Carolina real badly. And for good reason, again, Nicholas Harper is a five-star prospect, but he is an absolute freak of an athlete. He's a guy that is a world-class sprinter in the 100 meter dash for track and field. And as someone who could actually go professional in track and field and hopes to one day, I think break the record for the 100 meter dash in the United States. This is a kid that is extremely talented in multiple sports and has big aspirations for his future, which sounds like just the kind of prospect that Coach Shane Beamer and the staff 
would want to bring on board to this program. Now, this is going to be the first of three official visits that Nicholas Harbor is taking as he is visiting the Michigan Wolverines this next weekend, and then we'll be visiting LSU on October the 7th. So essentially, what you should gauge from that is it seems like that South Carolina, Michigan, and LSU are the three teams who have sort of separated themselves from the rest of the pack in Nicholas Harbor's recruitment. Again, that's not to say that none of these other schools are going to play a factor at the end here, but these three schools are the ones that are receiving an official visit for this fall season, at least up to this point. So it seems like Nicholas Harbor holds the most interest in these three programs. So what do the Gamecocks need to do this weekend in order for this official visit from Nicholas Harbor to be considered a success? Well, first and foremost, I'm not going to say that South Carolina has to go out there and defeat the Georgia Bulldogs on Saturday. I don't think that that's something that really plays that big of a factor in a prospect committing to a school. While obviously getting a big upset like one against the number one ranked Georgia Bulldogs would be huge and would be a great plus. There's not really a whole lot to lose in that regard unless the South Carolina Gamecocks were to go out there and just get obliterated and lose like, say, 62 to 3 or something like that, which... I don't think that's going to happen. Granted, you may not ever know with this Georgia Bulldog football team. But the point being, I don't think the final outcome of the game is going to likely have that big of an impact on this recruitment. So what they really need to do is this. They need to show Nicholas Harbor how they can get an athlete like him the football on offense. And the best way to do that is to get Jakeem Bell the ball in the passing game to try and have Jaheim Bell ball out in this game and showcase all of his abilities. While, again, it's okay to run Jaheim Bell out of the backfield a few times, Jaheim Bell, in my opinion, excels as mainly a receiving threat in the passing game. We have got to get back to that a little bit more this coming weekend. Nicholas Harbour is a kid that the Gamecock coaching staff, apparently according to many reports in Gamecock recruiting circles, have promised that he is going to play on both defense and offense. He is not going to play defense strictly. I think part of that is due to the fact that he doesn't want it to gain a whole lot of weight for football season, and then by the time track and field comes, he's all of a sudden got to cut down dozens of pounds of weight really fast to be able to sprint the 100 meter dash or whatever it is that he wants to do for his collegiate track and field career. So that makes a little bit of sense to pretty much give him freedom to decide really what it is that he wants to do and pretty much say, listen, you're just a great athlete overall and we're not trying to mess anything up with your future athletic career. So we're going to use you sort of however you prefer to be utilized. You want to play offense and defense? That's fine. The Gamecock coaching staff has been on board with that. So on the offensive end, you have got to get a guy like Jaheim Bell, who I think is the most comparable as an athlete to Nicholas Harbour, the football, show him how you could use him in this offense. Subsequently, the second thing you got to do, you're going to need to get creative and pass rush with our edge defenders. Jordan Birch is probably the defensive equivalent on South Carolina's team to Nicholas Harbour, a guy that was also a five-star recruit, also played defensive end in high school, and was someone who was touted as a fantastic athlete. Jordan Birch runs like in the four fives in the 40-yard dash. He is someone that has great speed, strength, and power that he showcases at that defensive end position. Now, obviously, it's going to be a little bit harder to try to maybe throw out as much as you would have wanted to with Jordan Strahd now being out at that other edge position, but you can still find ways to get creative and try to use Jordan Birch's athleticism to the best of your ability. In my opinion, the best way to do that is to run a bunch of stunts. Where stunts come into play with these alignments is basically you pick a pair of any two defensive linemen. And normally what you have happen is you have one of the defensive linemen crash in an opposite gap and then another defensive lineman, the guy that he's paired up with, sort of stand up and try to fake like he's going to pass rush like usual against the guy he's originally lined up against. But what he actually does is he takes one or two steps, then stops, plants, and then takes off and tries to go into the gap that has now been vacated by his teammate. That is a defensive line stunt move. And these stunt moves can be really productive for defensive lines where you have 
four really good athletes. Now, South Carolina across the board has that ability. Again, you might see a little bit of a downtick in the utilization of that with Gilbert Edmonds taking the place of Jordan Strawn. But with Zach Pickens, Alex Huntley, and Jordan Birch especially, those guys are all really good athletes where you could do this kind of stuff. So with Jordan Birch, it would be maybe a toe stunt, which would be tackle over end. So Jordan Birch, instead of going to the outside half of the offensive tackle, would crash inside to the offensive guard, and then Huntley or Pickens, whoever it ends up being, would then go to the outside of that offensive tackle that's now been vacated, try to wrap around, and either way, they're just trying to catch the offensive lineman completely off guard and see if one of the guys can break three. You've also got Eat and over tackle. Basically, the exact opposite. The tackle just decides to crash up and pretty much just try to make a mess in his original gap, while the defensive end goes up, again, fakes like he's going to pass rush on the edge, but instead goes around, wraps inside, and then tries to go in between the guard and the center to see if the center actually pays attention and picks him up or if the guard gives a call out while he's rushing inside. If that guard doesn't give a call out, that defensive end's going to go right on through scot-free and more than likely you're going to get a sack. I know that that was a long explanation, but the point being, that's the kind of stuff that this defensive coaching staff, Clayton White, a defensive coordinator, need to call to really showcase Jordan Birch's athleticism in this game and show how they can use Nicholas Harbour on defense. Lastly, they need to show Nicholas Harbour's family a good time. I think this is going to be his dad's first ever visit, period, or the first time he's ever watched a college football game live. South Carolina, of course, has made a lot of upgrades to the stadium with the LED lights and everything else. So they definitely have upgraded the venue. The venue ought to be great. The home crowd ought to show up. I would imagine that it's going to be either a near sellout or a complete sellout crowd. And again, with everything else that we have to offer from a facility standpoint, the relationships with the coaching staff, basically don't mess up any of those facets of the recruiting trip. And I've got no reason to believe that any of that is going to happen. I think that they're going to knock all of that out of the park. And that the thing they're really going to have to try to manipulate as much as they can is just how good the production on the field looks to Nicholas Harbour. Everything else off the field, I think will be taken care of, no problem, but still, you need to ensure that that part of the visit does go great, especially for the family, who can be a really important part in a recruitment for a guy like Nicholas Harbour. Welcome back to the final segment of today's show of the Locked On Gamecocks podcast, where we cover your team every single day in just 30 minutes. All right, so for this final segment of today's show. I wanted to sort of take a quick look back in history with South Carolina's football program, and I wanted to see within the last 10 years, how have the Gamecocks performed in matchups against top five teams at their own home stadium? Now, in the past 10 years, there's only been six instances where this has taken place, and it's between three different opponents, Georgia, Clemson, and Alabama. Now, out of these six matchups, South Carolina only has won one of them in the last 10 years. That was back in 2012 when they played the fifth-ranked Georgia Bulldogs at home and annihilated the Bulldogs in prime time, 35-7, to one of the biggest beatdowns in that series history. Then in 2015, the same season where Steve Spurrier had quickly all of a sudden retired in the middle of the season. Sean Elliott was the interim head coach for the Gamecocks for like the last five or six games. They would face the number one ranked Clemson Tigers at home at the end of the season and would lose a pretty close game considering the circumstances, 37 to 32. In 2017, they would play the third ranked Clemson Tigers at home. And yeah, they would lose that one 34 to 10. 2018 against number three, Georgia. They lost 41 to 17. 2019 against number two, Alabama at home. They lost 47 23. And then 2019 against the third ranked Clemson Tigers at home, they lost 38 to 3. So when looking at all these matchups, obviously the majority of these matchups did not go the Gamecocks way in any shape or form. So does this mean that South Carolina is guaranteed to lose this game? No, it's not a guarantee. There's always a chance in these kind of games. It's just that when you play opponents like number one Georgia heading into this weekend, those are the kind of games where your team can ill afford to make a bunch of mistakes. So why were some of these recent losses from 2017 onward especially so lopsided? Well, in my opinion, a lot of it had to do 
with the coaching staff that was in charge of the football program during that time period. As the coaching staff that was led by head coach Will Muschamp, of course, quite frankly was a coaching staff that no matter the changes that were made throughout his tenure, just could not ever win big games. Will Muschamp, as a head coach at South Carolina, and I was surprised by this stat, and I watched the entirety of this disaster unfold all the way to the end, Will Muschamp was 3-15 and in games versus top 25 opponents, which is just an absolutely horrific mark to have in these kinds of matchups. And it really shows that the program over the course of his time never really progressed, at least substantially at any point. So within the game, why was it that we did so bad under Will Muschamp? Well, part of it was Will Muschamp was a very risk-adverse type coach. He was extremely conservative in terms of the way that he wanted the flow of the game to go. And to be quite honest, when it comes to matchups like this one that we're about to play against number one Georgia this coming Saturday, being conservative and playing basically scared is not conducive to winning big games. Basically, if you're not going to take big risks, then you're not going to get big rewards like winning the football game. And another thing that really plagued the Gamecocks in these matchups, particularly these top five matchups at home, was inconsistent quarterback play. Of course, we all remember the saga of Jake Bentley, the kid who shedded his redshirt status in 2016 as a true freshman and was put in as a starting quarterback around halfway through the season, provided a spark to the offense, provided life to South Carolina, and helped lead us to a bowl game in 2016. But Jake Bentley just didn't really progress at the rate that we all thought he would from that point on. He had a lot of issues with decision making. He had some turnover problems that really showed up in an ugly way sometimes. And that would especially be the case in some of these games that he played like against Clemson, against Georgia in 2018. We would commit too many self-inflicted errors and that would end up biting us in the rear by the end of of the game. Of course, we had Ryan Holinsky in 2019. Ryan Holinsky was a true freshman, let's be honest. It was his first year as a major college football quarterback, so probably not really that fair to hold those two losses against him, against number two Alabama, number three Clemson. And then, of course, in 2020, you know, we played like four or five ranked opponents that season still. Colin Hill was our quarterback, and uh, yeah, Colin Hill just could not get the offense going in the passing game, and he could barely run out of the pocket, really, to say his life. So inconsistent play at the quarterback spot also definitely did not help Will Muschamp and his coaching staffs while he was here. So why is it that South Carolina have a better chance to make this game more competitive this year against Georgia at home? Well, besides the fact the Gamecocks have home field advantage, they now have a head coach who understands that he has got to take risk at times. Shane Beamer is not somebody who plays scared. He is somebody who likes to go for it on fourth down at times, likes to pull out special team trick plays from his bag of tricks. And he's somebody that understands the importance of doing things like that. Because the thing is, if you're a coach who is willing to take risk, then inherently what that does is it's going to cause the opposing coaching staff and the opposing team to sit back and think, okay, well, normally coaches would punt the ball here, but with this coach, we cannot bank on that fact. And it completely messes with their psyche. It changes up how they're going to call plays, even if it looks like you're going to send out the punt team. Maybe they end up calling a punt safe formation, or maybe they have more guys sort of stacked up on the line of scrimmage in the box just in case you decide to fake the punt. That kind of stuff matters in these kind of games. And so because of that, it will make the opposing coaching staffs think a little bit more. Now, again, does that mean that you're going to automatically win the game? No. When it comes to risk like that, there's basically a 50% chance it's either going to work and you're going to be lauded as a genius head coach and it'll be looked at as a play that could have changed the entire outcome of that ball game if things work out in the end. If it doesn't work, then you're an absolute moron. You're an idiot. You're a head coach that doesn't have any idea what he's doing. The moment was too big for you and it was a reason that you lost the game in the end if the outcome doesn't go your way. But the point being is Shane Beamer and this coaching staff are not going to play scared. They're not going to go out there and play this conservative style of football that Will Muschamp and his staff ended up playing while they were here. 
So purely because of that, I think South Carolina is going to be better suited to play bigger opponents like Georgia in these kind of games. Now, from a talent standpoint, South Carolina also does have a decent amount of talent on this roster. It might not be up to Georgia's level exactly, but there's very few teams, quite frankly, that can match Georgia's level of talent that they have on that roster. South Carolina still has one of the top 20 most talented rosters in the entire country, according to 24-7 Sports Team Talent Composite Rankings. They got a guy in Spencer Rattler that, yes, is still trying to figure out how exactly to operate in a pro-style offense. He can make bad decisions at times, but he's got really solid arm talent. And if there's a guy, quite frankly, that could win a football game against a team like this Georgia team, it's a guy where you can have some high-risk cover Award play like Spencer Rattler. Think of Steven Garcia in 2010 against Bama. He played the game of his life that day, completing, I believe, 20 of 21 passes. Steven Garcia was a guy that had plenty of moments that made you sit there and scratch your head and wonder why he was starting for Steve Spurrier in the SEC. But that was a game where he showed why he was such a highly regarded quarterback coming out of high school. Spencer Rattler could potentially have that same kind of moment here against the Georgia Bulldogs. Again, does that mean the South Carolina is going to win the game? No. But does it mean that I think this game could be closer than it would have been a few years back? Absolutely. So what are y'all's thoughts on this South Carolina-Georgia game? Do you think that we are better suited now to be more competitive in a game like this because of the coaching staff that is leading us and because of the talent that we have on the roster. Also, what are your thoughts on the Muhammad Cobb and George Strawn injuries? Do you think these injuries are going to hurt us a lot worse than I even mentioned? Is there something I didn't mention that you think should have been brought up as a potential adverse impact from those injuries? And then lastly, how do you feel about Nicholas Harbour's official visit coming up this weekend? How confident are you that maybe we are the lead school for him? Maybe we have a really solid chance to get his commitment at the end of the day because of a visit like this one. I want to hear all of y'all's thoughts, as always, down below in the comments section if you're watching today's show on YouTube. But, of course, if you're listening to today's show on an audio podcast app, wherever you get your podcast daily, you can also feel free to shoot me a message at a lion underscore SC on Twitter. I did make sure to fix that, by the way, to whoever ended up commenting on my episode the other day. And I promise I'll respond to any replies or comments that you have for me as quickly as I see them. And of course, if you've enjoyed the Logs on Gamecocks podcast and you want to get more news on the entire SEC conference, then go check out Chris Gordy of the Locked On SEC podcast, where he has discussions with the local team experts of SEC conference teams for the Locked On Podcast Network, and he takes you across the entire SEC in just 30 minutes. So again, make Locked On SEC your second listen after, of course, the Locked On Gamecocks podcast. But once again, y'all, that does it for me on today's show. I hope that y'all have a great rest of your Tuesday. I will catch y'all on the next show of the Locked On Gamecocks podcast.